for the bank holiday. Now on BBC One at ten past nine, the news with Peter Sissons. A revolution in the sport of rugby union. It's going professional. The international body decides amateurism has had its day and the players can be paid what they can get. Britain rejects Albert Reynolds' urging to talk peace before IRA arms are decommissioned. And Schumacher wins but gets a warning not to try these tactics again. The sport of rugby union is to become fully professional. The amateur ethic that has been its hallmark, if not the entire reality, for 125 years is to be ended next month. The International Rugby Board, meeting in Paris, decided that players at all levels can then be paid without limit. The board's president called it a sporting revolution. Today's decision by the International Rugby Board brings about the most radical change in the sport for 100 years. Pressure for a relaxation of the rules governing rugby union has been mounting for some time, but no one was prepared for today's announcement that the amateur game was dead. Rugby will become an open game. There will be no provision on payment or the provision of other material benefit to any person involved in the game. The success of the sport on a global scale following three World Cup tournaments helped force this decision. Rupert Murdoch's recent multi-million pound deal to televise Australia, New Zealand and South African matches made the IRB realise that control of the sport's future was slipping from its hands. They're both handy start, away we go and just pass it across the grids, we just get the legs working. The decision covers all levels of the game, not just international play and the glamour matches. Come on, pick it up, pick it up. These Bath players here training for the coming season can now be paid for taking the field and receive bonuses for winning. I think it's a good decision. I think it's the right decision. I think rugby's going to always keep its, its spirit. Yeah, there's going to be uh, top players. They're going to be earning uh, reasonable bank amounts of money now. But uh, I, don't, I don't actually think that it's going to affect the spirit of the club. From these part-timers, teachers, students, a farmer and a British gas employee, a clutch of trophies and league championships have been won in the last decade. For the country's leading clubs like Bath, the move towards professionalism and the scrapping of the amateur code is good news. Bath can afford to pay wages, while for the top players, increased sponsorship and promotion financially means the sky's the limit. The club boasts at present eight full internationals. They perhaps stand to gain the most from the game becoming professional. It's just great to get the endorsement from the IRB and uh, things can be all above board and we can get on with it, you know, improvements of, within the game. There's more and more amounts of time players are putting into the game. Um, it's, it's possibly fair enough that they get some sort of compensation for that. Um, I just hope it doesn't change the sort of ethos of the game and, and the good spirit that it's played in. An average gate at Bath who are in Courage League One is 8,000 spectators. In contrast, at Haven't Rugby Club, where Bath train today, and who play in League Four, it's between two and 300. It'll be very bad for the lower clubs. There's going to be a lot of sponsorship required. People are going to be fighting for sponsorship. And I think you might take a little bit of the love of the game away. Some members of the international board were also worried about what professionalism might mean. But what everyone agrees is good about today's decision is that the hypocrisy that existed, where players were being paid out of trust funds and under the table in order to meet the sport's amateur requirements, is thankfully a thing of the past. Clive Myrie, BBC News, Hampshire. The British government has firmly rejected Albert Reynolds' proposals to break the logjam in the Northern Ireland peace process. The former Irish Prime Minister called on Britain to ease the timetable for the surrender of IRA weapons. There's a nationalist consensus that the peace process has stalled and that the British government's hard line on no talks before the decommissioning of paramilitary weapons is the problem. Hence Mr Reynolds' suggestion. It was never envisaged, you know, that we would have this deadlock over decommissioning. It never was, and the public record will show that. But having said that, I mean, there, there's guns on both sides. There's ammunition on both sides. Treat both sides the same. Have a decommissioning during the process, but not as a precondition to start the talks process. There's no historic precedent for it in Ireland. There's no historic precedent for it around the world. 
President Clinton also apparently believes that such issues should be a matter for all party talks, not a precondition to them, a view shared by Sinn Féin. The British government needs to uh, be part of this process, that they are the, the one group, the one element which has failed to respond with the generosity and the flexibility that's required. Mr Reynolds, Mr Adams and John Hume, the three men most credited, on the nationalist and republican side at least, with bringing about the ceasefires, received a peace prize in County Mayo. With them, a senior British embassy official, accepting on behalf of John Major. His government's view is all party talks wouldn't be any such thing, as unionists won't sit round the same table with those they see as still having guns under it. There's no question of unionists taking part in any inclusive talks process unless there's a clear commitment both to exclusively peaceful methods and to democratic principles by all concerned. Mr Reynolds' compromise idea, acceptable to Republicans and Loyalists, has though been firmly ruled out tonight by the Northern Ireland office. It said a credible start must be made to decommissioning before substantive talks. A process on any other basis would not be sustainable, either in constitutional or democratic terms. The next few weeks are critical to the future of the peace process. Right now, there's no softening of positions. Dennis Murray, BBC News, County Mayo. Clergy in the Diocese of Oxford hope their new guidelines on avoiding sexually compromising situations will be adopted nationally. The code has become more significant after last week's allegations surrounding the Reverend Chris Brain in Sheffield. Worship this evening at the church where the ill-fated nine o'clock service began its life. I'd encourage you to reach out with sensitivity and love. At Europe's largest Christian arts festival, Greenbelt, taking place near Corby, the troubles of the nine o'clock service were in everyone's thoughts today as well. The Sheffield team paid a visit here three years ago, raising many a critical eyebrow with the extravagance and sensuality of their presentation. But many festival goers have taken their lead in devising innovative worship from the nine o'clock service. We to pray today for the shattered community of the nine o'clock service in Sheffield asking that God would mend broken hearts and minds. Greenbelt's organisers concede that all the negative publicity about alternative worship during the past week hasn't been good advertising for it. They insist that the Sheffield saga should no more damn all such worship than a scandal involving a Catholic priest should bring the mass under attack. But they say it's right for people to be wary. It's to help prevent any such abuses of power in the future that this vicar has produced a code of conduct for his diocese. The sort of situation he urges ministers to avoid, late night meetings with women parishioners and sitting too close when giving advice. All of us have the possibility of falling into temptation um, and I'm not sure that guidelines are ever going to stop that. Um, but they may actually make some people stand back and think.